I was living in Maryland. So when I lived in Maryland with that naval guard, I gave CPS an address. They had an address of where to send documentation to one month earlier than when, than when they sent it. They were always updated on my whereabouts. There was one week where they didn't know where I was, and that was when I was en route to the East Coast. So they made, a lot of, made up a lot of lies about it, saying we didn't know where you were, but that was a lie. They always knew. And then, then I continued to work there at the post pub as a waitress. I, I did well enough. I made pretty very good tips. I made much better tips there than anywhere else. And I was told because the minimum wage there is two dollars, and then a lot of people have have more money to spend in Washington D.C. I was, I was taking home about $300 or so a night for 30 hours a week, um, or less. It was per night, so it was, it was fairly good to money. And the, some of the people that were running the place were Catholics. They all treated me with decency for, at first. And then they were telling me that I could get a free meal there. So I had their free meal. You know, every employee got one. It was part of being an employee. And I ate there. And then I stopped really having my, my period started to kind of dwindle. And I later became sort of, I rightly suspicious about what was happening with my period. And I thought, felt that thought that I was possibly being medicated in some way. And the only way that I could have been medicated would be would have been through that free meal. So I started to buy my lunches at a convenience place, you know, already prepackaged and everything. And that was a couple months later. That was pretty much um, when things started to kind of go downhill because I think they wanted me to keep eating their free dinner, their their free meal, and I think somebody started to worry that I was figuring things out. I also, around that time, I was still trying to get my son, so I went, I made several attempts to contact CPS in D.C., and the judge, Dennis, told in Washington State, told me that I could have a quote-unquote psychological, the, the um, required psychological evaluation done over there. So all I had to do, he, is what I, was, what I was told, is that you know, it's all under the Department of Family and Children's Services. So they have contracts, they have interstate contracts that they make. And if I lived in a different state, and one state wanted me to have a an evaluation, it wasn't a problem for CPS to set that up in another state. All it required was a signature. So I was told that that would, would be done and could be done, and I then contacted the Washington, D.C. CPS and I tried to get that set up. I was also then being required to do urinalysis and I tried to set up um, urinalysis too because they were claiming they had two claims that I was mentally ill that was their first lie and their second lie was that I was drug seeking and a drug user. So I was trying to get the urinalysis going and would have gone voluntarily to any number of clinics in Washington, D.C. And I would have gone immediately to a psychological um, psychologist because I knew that, I, that I, there was no reason why I couldn't prove that I wasn't nuts, I wasn't mentally ill. So after C CPS in D.C., I, gave, I told them about, they sound like, they, like, yes, they did that, and they did it all the time, no problem. And then I told them who the contact person was in Wenatchee, Washington, and gave them that information. And the next time that I was contacted by Washington, D.C. CPS, their entire tone had changed. Because somebody in Wenatchee, Washington, had prejudiced me and defamed me to Washington, D.C. Someone was working something out, I think, under the table as well. So then they were telling me that I couldn't get things done there, or it was going to take months and months and months, and it wasn't. 
I finally went there in person. I found out where the CPS offices were, and I took a, a bus myself to go there in person. I had to get checked in, had to sign a little ledger, a log that was there. And I met with someone and said, told them what I, what my objectives were, what I had to do to comply with a court order. And they said, okay, thank you for that information, we'll make sure we get this going. Well, then I never heard from them again. So everybody was stalling and then they were saying they couldn't do it, so I, um, or just ignoring me. So I went again in person. I went to that CPS office in Washington, D.C. about three times in person. And the third time, I finally sat down with somebody and said, well, why can't this be done right, right now? And she said, well, you need to send, sign a release to Wenatchee, Washington, and then they can contact us and set that up. And, you know, they could have said that from the very start. But I said, okay, well, can't I sign that right now? I'd like to sign the release right here and now. Why can't you fax that to them? They were just basically trying to stall and, and create additional steps and delay with time. So then she said, no, we, we don't really do that. I said, could I talk to a supervisor or someone else about that? And I asked to have somebody else come in and confirm for me what that process was. I said, well, who does that kind of a processing? And she told me, so then that man came into the offices, and while that man was, was sitting there, and after I'd explained to him what I needed to get done, while he was present, I then said to her again, I said, so what I would like to do is I'd like to sign that release of information that you have. And, and then I asked him, and I turned to him, and I said, and do you think that we could get that faxed over to Washington, D.C.? Is that something we could do? And then, was that acceptable? And he said, oh yeah, no problem. And then he said, you've got that, you've got the facts, the release of information. So she opens up, here she is the entire time with when she was just with me, me and her, by ourselves, telling me she can't do that, and they don't, they don't allow that, and they don't have that kind of thing. And then when I bring a second person into it, she's opening up her desk drawer like this, and right on the very top is a whole stack of release of information documents already pre-printed for, for the very purpose of what I had gone to see her about. So she takes one out, puts it on the desk, and I looked it over, signed it, and then he took it and sent it over to Wenatchee, Washington CPS. And during this entire time that I am doing everything I can to comply with the court order and I'm being obstructed, which is a felony, because people went out of their way to obstruct me from, from um, getting this whole thing done. They were trying to, the individuals in D.C. and in Wenatchee were claiming that I was not cooperating. And not cooperating is an excuse for saying that you're not interested in your own child and getting them back. So here I was cooperating. I was trying to get everything done and they were not cooperating. I had telephone visits. They were, had already been scheduled, and I still had telephone visits with my son while I was in D.C. Those continued, and they continued up until the point that I then got pregnant by Chris Dabney. Actually, there was one other thing that occurred before that. It was a situation where there was a man from Texas, also by the name of James, who was a drummer for a band actually a, um, an already, a, a, an already kind of on the radio kind of country western or rock band. And I didn't meet him until I was, I typically, the, the rest of the time that I was at the Post Pub, I was staying at Chris Dabney's house, um, pretty much just with him. And then he told me he had a girlfriend. He had a different girlfriend, he decided. So I just stayed there, but um, he had designated me as not being his girlfriend. He had this other woman who was a girlfriend who was a Jew. And after 
he decided that I was I and pretty much at, at the workplace I didn't then get drunk again I'm, I did the one time that I went with him the first time and I maybe had one drink every now and then but it wasn't every single day that I worked there at all and it wasn't it wasn't a habit and I wasn't getting wasted I had a little bit to drink here and there but I wasn't getting like totally totally um, incapacitated so one day one night I had stayed a little bit later and then I was going to get a taxi I always took a taxi home so I always had my 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 I paid with a tip for a taxi with my tip money and I was totally I, I just felt like that night getting drunk and you know I have a right to do that if I want to and things were extremely stressful. CPS was harassing me. They weren't doing what they said they were going to do. And I was really traumatized with with what was going on. So I had already had several drinks. And then I was... I had never had Jaeger before. Or a Jaeger shot. I, I, I don't think I had ever tried Jaeger before in my life. And I didn't know that it was really high proof. But someone did tell me. They informed me that it was first, after I'd already had these drinks, and I thought, well, I might try it, because they said, well, well why don't you try a Jaeger shot? And that was Nikki telling me to do that. And Nikki was kind of this pal swinger, had this pal swinger relationship with Chris Dabney. And she almost had her psych degree in psychology, but not quite. Like, she was a few credits away. She was a Virginia bred person, just like Chris was. Virginia bred. Born and raised in Virginia. And so she's, she told me to have, she kept, I think, giving me free drinks, like wanting me to try different things that she was mixing up, because she then be, got a bartending job behind the bar, and um, she was mixing things up in different ways, and wanted me to try different concoctions, and I did. And then I had someone buy me a drink, so that's why I was really over the limit already. And she said, why don't you try a Jaeger shot? Have you ever tried that? And I said, no. So I, a lot of times I was just being kind of going along. And I was going to take a taxi home again, but then after I had this Jaeger shot, I was, um, I was so drunk I almost, I could blink, and it was like darker than usual for a little while. And all of a sudden, somebody brought in this, this person from Texas with the name of James. And they were telling me, basically, um, I think Chris or somebody was telling me I, I couldn't go to the house that night. They were telling me to go with that guy. And I had no place to stay. And I, even though I had my, all my things at the other place, so I stayed at this hotel of this man named James, who was a drummer in a band. Like a professional one that had already already had records or CDs or whatever. And I, he was from Texas. He said that, and he told me, I was so drunk, and he told me that he was married, but they were about to get a divorce or something. And he was the only person that, um, like while I was totally intoxicated, what, um, he was the only married person that I was with when, while intoxicated that I knew at the time was married, but at the same time I was so like almost blacking out drunk. I wasn't thinking straight about anything. And basically he wasn't drunk. So then I was taken advantage of in that situation. The only other person I'd ever been around that was married, who I found out was married later, was James Cartwright. But it wasn't like I was I, mean, I wasn't just going around with different people. I was pretty much being shoved and forced into different position, into um, different situations. Always after I was completely drunk, and I didn't have a drinking problem either. I mean, in every situation where I then became intoxicated, you know, if I was intoxicated. 10 times in five years, there was always a setup, and in almost every 10, every one of those 10 times, something bad was happening to me. 